How's it going? Um, I hope you're having a great first day slash first day of the, the sessions at reInvent. Um, I hope you had a great keynote and excited by all the new uh, features and services coming out. Um, my name is Mark. I'm a solutions architect uh, based in our Berlin office. Um, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not really German. Uh, I just kind of work there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, joining me today will be Gemma and Anne, uh, and also Ian. Uh, so they'll come up later and, and do their bits. Um, so I work with a number of gaming companies uh, based in Germany. Um, I'm very happy to be here, uh, as it gives me a chance to chat with a whole lot of other companies. I love chatting to customers. So if you spot me in the hallway, come by, say hi. You know, <laughs> I may have stickers or something on me and that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> so something I hear pretty often from uh, my gaming customers is that they really like AWS. Um, one of the main reasons is because it allows them to focus on what's important to them. Rather than worrying about infrastructure and scaling this, they can just focus on that important building the next great game. But probably the most important aspect for them is scalability. So if you were working in the traditional world, you would have to predict how popular your game was ahead of time, how many users you're going to have online uh, at any given time. And that's going to fluctuate a little bit. Not everybody plays in the middle of the night. Not everybody plays in, plays in the middle of the day. And obviously, you, you have different time zones and that kind of thing. So to allow for that demand, you would have to go out and buy servers. And this was kind of a delicate uh, practice because you would have to make sure that you got it right. If you bought too many servers, then you had excess capacity, which basically meant that you had servers sitting around not doing much. You were wasting dollars there. If you bought too few, then you had unmet demand. Uh, and this often resulted in upset players because you know, games would crash, they couldn't join sessions, these kind of things. It's not a great player experience. Also, if you're using uh, this as a revenue stream, this could mean missed revenue for you as players can't log in, uh, can't yeah, <laughs> pay for um, in-app purchases, et cetera. It's a very rigid model. In the AWS world, your demand goes up and down throughout the day. And you're able to scale. Uh, there we go. You're able to scale the capacity to meet that. It's a very elastic world. Scale up as more players come on board, scale down as they go down. Additionally, we have 11 regions around the globe. This is great because you often want to build a game that targets customers all around the globe. So it means that you can run in regions that are close to your users, uh, meaning they get experience lower latency. So let's talk about some of the common uh, concepts when you're building a game backend. Usually what you do is separate your infrastructure out into an application that then calls against the backend. So you're usually thinking in terms of like APIs. Often these are HTTP or JSON over HTTP or HTTPS. And usually you're using methods such as like get friends, uh, get the leaderboard, put a new score, et cetera. You also commonly want to pull down, pull down binary asset data um, because when you ship an application to an app store or something, there are maximum sizes around how big your app can be. And you don't want to have like uh, videos and stuff inside of that. You may want to pull those down on the fly uh, or any kind of images or that kind of thing. Um, in some cases, you also need multiplayer servers to uh, keep track of state when you have multiple players uh, coming into the game at the same time. Um, like who's leading the session, uh, you know, which, which players are in which location, et cetera. And of course, you want to architect for high availability and high scalability. So let's take a little look about how you might uh, go about building this on top of AWS. So first, you have your users on their devices. Um, the first thing you need to do is pick the regions that are most relevant uh, for your end customers. 
So if you find uh, that you have customers running in multiple regions, you may want to uh, launch in multiple AWS regions. So for instance, if you have players in the US, you may want to consider some of the US regions, uh, maybe some of the Asian regions for Asian customers, and maybe some of the European regions for customers in Europe. Once you've picked the region or regions that you want to run in, you then think about availability zones. Uh, these are um, physically isolated um, zones that you can run multiple servers in to achieve high availability. And we always recommend running at least two of these. You then want to boot the uh, app servers for your application. Um, so you may install uh, like a web server or something on top of here. You would boot an instance in each AZ, or instances in each AZ. And then you would use our Elastic Load Balancing Service to set up a load balancer to distribute the traffic across those instances. Again, you may need to store some kind of state here. Um, the most common way to do this is store it in a database. Um, of course, you can just boot EC2 instances and install any database you would like on top of that. But then you need to think about things like, how do we scale this? Um, how do we do backups? How do we do patches, et cetera? One of the easier options here I would recommend looking at is our RDS service. RDS offers managed uh, databases for MySQL, Postgres, MSSQL, Oracle, Aurora, and as announced today, MariaDB. Also, it's very easy to set up a replica in another AZ. You just che check a checkbox, and it automatically sets it up for you. OK, so we have the basic infrastructure there. Let's talk about how we might improve that to help us scale out a little bit more. First, let's move any static assets and game data away to S3. This will be things like images, video files, et cetera. Uh, but it may also be, also be user-generated content. So let's say your game allows users to take photos and upload those. S3 would be a great thing for this. Additionally, if you have analytics files that you generate yourself, this could be a great place for these as well. We can also couple this with CloudFront, our CDN service. Uh, and this allows those assets to be cached at edge locations closer to your users, um, improving the experience for them. Additionally, you can also uh, upload through S3 and CloudFront. So that helps take some of the load off the servers there. This allows us to basically reduce the instance size to only what we need to run those backend services. And then we can think about using an auto scaling group to scale up and down based on the demand that's coming in. The other cool thing there is that auto scaling implements uh, some health checks which you can use to basically auto heal your environment. So it, it knows how many instances it should be running. And if you should have an instance fail those health checks, it will automatically pull it out and replace it for you. As the load comes in, we can scale these instances up. Sorry. Another way we may be able to take some load off of the database is thinking about using an in-memory cache. Amazon Elastic Cache is a great option here. Um, it offers managed memcache and Redis, um, both of which are in-memory caches, which you can use to cache frequently accessed data, such as like uh, leaderboards or these kind of things. OK, that's great for read-heavy games. But not all games are read-heavy. Some are very write-heavy, especially if you're constantly writing the state of the world to the back end. So in those cases, caching is going to be of limited use. Um, if you're constantly writing, you're not necessarily going to need to hit that cache. Many of these uh, datas that you are writing to the back end tend to be either key value or binary structures, um, such as like 
player location, or maybe an object telling uh, something about the state of the world. And very quickly in those use cases, the database can become the bottleneck. You're writing a ton of data to that database, and often it's not able to keep up with the amount of data that you're using it. It's not the right use case for that data. So one way of kind of traditionally thinking about this is an approach called sharding. Sharding is an interesting process. Um, it's basically taking your one database with everything in it and the slave that is obviously attached to that as well and dividing that data up. So in this case, I'm using a very basic uh, thing here of if the user ID is A through M, we split it out to one database. If it's N through Z, it's in another database. Um, in real life, you would probably use some kind of consistent hash to determine this, but I'm just doing this for simplicity. As well as splitting the data out, you usually have to write some extra logic in the application to handle this and tell it, OK, if the user is uh, username A through M, it's on database one. If it's N through Z, it's on database two. This is cool until those records keep expanding. And then you need to reshard and then do the whole process again and figure out, OK, where is my data now? Is it in this old database? Is it a new one? You need to copy it over and make sure that you have all the data still there. This is not an easy process, and there's a lot of risk involved in kind of doing that. Also, in the games industry where you want to build games, it's not fun. Like, it's not something you want to concentrate on. What I would advise instead is moving out to a database that suits this workload better. I think DynamoDB is a better use case here. It's a fully managed NoSQL data store. Instead of uh, traditional databases where you need to think about how much storage do I have in this database and how quickly am I running out of that, when will I need to bump the next amount of storage, et cetera, DynamoDB will automatically provision that storage for you, but it asks you to think about how much throughput you need. As you bring more users on board, you're probably going to need more throughput, but you can easily scale that up and down as you need to. It also allows for secondary indexes. I'll talk a little bit more on those in a second. Uh, and it's very easy to kind of put and get the keys there. Another very cool feature that I'll talk on in a second is the document support. OK, so let's look at how we would use DynamoDB to build a leaderboard here. In this case, I've set up my uh, hash key, um, which is basically my primary key, to be my user ID. I then create a range key, which you can sort of think of as like a sub key or a key that you can sort on uh, to be the board name or the level name. It depends on the type of game, but let's say it's kind of the level that you're playing. So we want to figure out who, like what my score is for this level. I then don't need to define any other attributes. I can just publish them as need be. So in this case, I'm publishing the top score and also like the top score date. So this would be for user 101 uh, when they played the level Galaxy Invaders. They got this top score on that date. So it's very easy to figure out what a user's top score is for each level. But what if we want to figure out what the global top score is? This is where those secondary indexes come in. OK, so what we've done here is define a secondary index of that table. We first set the hash key to be that board name or the level name. So in this case, uh, maybe we have a, a level called Alien Adventure. Um, we then set a range key for that top score. So we pull in the top score from there. Uh, and then we don't need to define the user ID. We can just project those extra attributes as we need to. Because we have the hash key and the range key, it's very easy to kind of sort on what is the top score for this level and then figure out who has that user ID. So we can query by the, the board name or level name and sort by that top score. 
And this is a very common use case across quite a lot of games, I think. Um, quite a lot of games these days have a top score. Okay, so let's talk about those documents. I think this is a very interesting use case. So we added this feature a little while ago, but I think it's, it's quite relevant for, for gaming here and, and also many other application types. When we built DynamoDB, uh, the, the types that we offered were string, number, binary, and then we had multi-value types of string set, number set, and binary set. So these were basically sets of those things. Uh, we later added Boolean and null. We also added a couple of document types, a list and a map. And these are very special types because they can contain other types as well as themselves. So for instance, I can build a data structure that looks like this. Um, I have a, a string that's my name. I may have a, a list of the games I've played and then a map of the scores for those games. The nice thing is we can use the DynamoDB SDK to write stuff like that, and it will automatically transform it into the native types for us, which is pretty cool. The other cool thing about that, once we have those native types, is that we can do document content addressing. So what does that mean? It means I can call document.score.megablast and just trundle down the JSON until I can find that score. I can use that for gets and updates, which is pretty cool. OK, so this session is about gaming, uh, not so much about DynamoDB. So I don't have a lot of time to explain all the cool features about DynamoDB. But if this is interesting to you, I highly recommend you check out these sessions. Uh, DAT 204 on uh, NoSQL, uh, no worries. Uh, DAT 401, um, that's a deep dive on Am Amazon DynamoDB. And then there is uh, GAM 401, uh, which is building a serverless mobile game. Cool. All right, that's enough rambling from me. Uh, let me invite Jamin and Ann up to talk about uh, how he and his team from Dev Sisters have built a, a game using these. Yeah, cool. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, hi, I'm Jay Manan. I'm from Dev Sisters. Yeah, you can call me Jay. Uh, today, I will talk about this topic, especially focused on mobile. Dev Sisters is a game co company in Korea. We made a mobile game named Quirky Run, and we were quite successful in Korean and Asian market. I will talk about the very first launch history, happenings we had, how we changed our architecture, and number of outage situations, and some maybe useful tips we have. So I will first talk about our situation during development, how we started preparing our backend on AWS, and then I will move on to how we improve our architecture. Lastly, some tips and tricks with retrospect. Uh, before that, I will briefly introduce Cookie Run. Most of you would not have heard about it, right? So let's first see our game trailer. This might help you get some glimpse of our game. Yeah, it worked. And maybe sounds included in this video, but <laughs> it doesn't play. You can see our cookies. That's our main character. Hero cookie, yeah, a ninja cookie, and some, yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I will make sound on my mouth. So. <laughs> <laughs>
Ja, fantastisch. <laughs> so, as you've seen, Cookie Run is a running action game involving cookie running over obstacles and eating jellies. Cookie Run game had more than 70 million downloads and has at most 10 million users a day. Cookie Run was recorded the most downloaded free game in 10 countries like Korea, Japan, and Thailand, and also top 10 free game in 38 countries. Especially, Cookie Run is famously known in Korea and Thailand. It was launched in April 2013 and have opened for two and almost half years. Oh, I clearly deleted this slide, so, uh, yeah, uh, I don't care. <laughs> so the left top picture is our company and the middle two pictures are really delicious food of our company owned restaurant. Yeah, you can see the steak and lamb. And there are some consumer products here. Yeah, this is pretty enough boasting. So let's get back to the main topic, how we started. Oh, let's go back to the early 2013. At that time, Depsitters was a really tiny and homeless company. There was literally no infrastructure available, only one server developer, only one gaming service named OpenBreak2. Backend of OpenBreak2 was developed with AWS, and also we have only one month to develop Cookie Run with one server developer. Uh, these were the goals of backend when it started. There was only one server developer. We had to automate as much as possible and reduce system operations. High reliable, quality assured. These are the natural goals of the game server. Also, we wanted scalable design with auto configured and scaled. We want to focus on the server development itself to make better game. Real time monitoring systems are important too. And minimally working log storing system was one of the goals. So these are also of the first step. And I will explain those things in this slide. So this is the picture of our design. ELB route user traffic between two availability zones and front-end game server service handle the request. All data are stored in RDS. Ah, front-end game service, uh, we use Java and Spring MVC for front-end game service. And all data are stored in RDS, MySQL. Uh, for the rest, we have monitoring system with Javix and Graphite. And we also have Chef server to deploy automatically. And log string system and patch deploy system is constructed with AWS S3. No, so we, we start the service, our service with this design. Then something happened. We got 2 million DAU in about 11 days after launch. So, traffic leads to the problems. Now, I will explain what problems we had and how we advanced our architecture. First, we needed to resign, redesign the backend. The traffic was killing our service. Then we improved the login system, then game page system, and we later created global user rankings to our game. Uh, the first one is uh, redesign the backend. There is the item called Heart, which is needed to play the game like Candy Crush Saga. The problem is that users can send hearts to friends. Initially, we implemented this feature with MySQL, but data size increased rapidly. Basically, if the number of users is n, the number of data size needed goes to n squared. So this table becomes the first problem of our design. Uh, this problem occurred one month after launch. Lacking any short-term solutions, we opened unlimited heart event and disabled this feature. But this cannot be an ultimate solution. We need to come up with a solution quickly. So we eventually started to consider NoSQL databases. We decided that Couchbase is the most suitable NoSQL database for us. So not only the game data, like shop item data, game state data are stored in MySQL. And user data, like user items, labels, coins, etc., are stored in Couchbase. MySQL is the only part to hard to scale out, so we migrated the majority of our data to NoSQL gradually. Yeah, that was a good lesson. 
general rule of thumb is that if the row size goes bigger than 100 million, then RDB may not handle them. So we changed this very first design to this one. You can see the Couchbase cluster edit. And the next requirement was that real-time log viewing system. When we update, we have to confirm that game, working is no, game is working normally, checking user score, and we have confirmed if there are any averaging point. So we have to see logs in real time. We built real-time log viewing system based on Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, also known as ERK stack. So this picture is changed to this one. Log storing system is rebuilt with Logstash to refine the logs before storing. Elasticsearch is used to search and filter logs. It is a screenshot of our real-time log viewing system. You can find some graphs and recent JSON row logs, and you can search and filter logs here. Uh, and the next thing is that make better game patch system. App Store binary size is limited and is not enough to contain all resources, such as images and sound files. So some resources are not included in initial binary. When, and when users start a game, those are downloaded on demand. So we used to upload these resources to AWS S3 and serve to users with a public S3 link. Yeah, that's a problem. I don't use it like that. S3 is not designed to handle massive number of requests, so it turned to be very problematic. AWS CloudFront is a proper way to solve this problem. So this design is changed to this one. You can see the cloud front edge and resource managing servers added. Yeah. And now back to the log system. After we operated this game over a year, we had a bunch of logs. We want to analyze what in-game events were really effective. When users get out of our game, how the new user experiences and etc. It wasn't easy. Our logs were already greater than 10 terabytes. We had to look for big data solutions. So we built a log analyze system with several big data platforms. First, we started with Apache Hadoop and went to Scolding. And then now we use Spark and Spark SQL to analyze logs. So this design is advanced to this one. Log analysis system with Spark on EC2 built. So now we can analyze logs with using a bunch of instances. And also can see graph of daily stats. The last thing, adding global user ranking system. It is not easy to order all users with their scores. So we built this system with ready sorted set also called GSET. Obviously, we did some tuning such as custom caching and a lot of optimized techniques to reduce the Redis CPU load. So this picture is changed to this one. We added Elastic Cache to add global user ranking system. And we also added some more operation tools, such as schedule bug push system. Yeah. Now I'm on the part of tips and tricks. And be careful. This is based on a true story of a very sad DevOps team. So <laughs> this can happen to you anytime. <laughs> so yeah, be careful. First one is uh, auto-scaling gotchas. When many users connect to the game simultaneously, auto-scaling cannot handle that situation. This kind of outage occurred more than 10 times during two years. Of course, mistuned auto scan policy can be a problem, but the real problem, problem is that game server needs three to five minutes to bootstrap, and massive number of users connect in that three to five minutes. The reason can maybe a uh, holiday season, or event, or a bug push notification, or some, like, some more exotic. Then it reaches a critical point, then meltdown starts. So, 
Auto scaling cannot handle spiky loads, so we have to predict traffic surges and prepare beforehand. So this is the example. This is screenshot. This, this screenshot is our scheduled bulk push system. You can see increased AWS instance option before sending bulk push. Yeah, we made this system. Uh, another auto scaling gotchas. There are some tips in here. First, don't send minimum instance of one or two. If there is only one machine and it dies, then obvious service will fail. Then the there, is, there are two machines and one machine dies, then the other machine gets twice the load, then service will fail. So we set minimum instance of four. Second, use multiple availability zones. Sometimes instance availability of a single AG can run out. So if you do auto scaling on a single AG, auto scaling may fail. Yeah. Also, don't forget enable cross zone load balancing then ELB ensures that requests are distributed equally to your backend instances regardless of the AG in which they are located. Uh, and third, needless to say, scale-up policy is so important. After countless experiments and outreach, our policy is to add four instances <coughs> when latency exceeds 100 milliseconds for two minutes, and remove two instances when average CPU utilization is below 10% for two minutes. Yeah, last, this scale-up can be a useful option. If the CPU is the bottleneck, lag, compute-optimized instance is a good option. Also, using higher type of instance is available. Select according to your needs on CPU, memory, and price. Uh, and the next failure case is chef server failure case. Uh, our auto scaling process relied on a single, single chef server, but chef server can be a single point of failure. When you added 200 servers at once, our chef server became unresponsive and service failed. So, yeah, errors can happen in unexpected places. And now I would like to introduce the most terrible failure of our service. We run Couchbase on EC2. EC2 instance can die, front-end game server can crash, we don't worry. But if Couchbase EC2 instance dies, this can lead to one of the most painful service outage. Yeah, it really happened. So someday in June 2015, that was a dark and depressing day. It was the biggest, longest, and the most serious service outage of our company history. Server was down for 12 consecutive hours, and it was a disk error in a couch base. Moreover, our daily backup script had not worked for one week prior to the outage. Yeah. Some data were replicated in other machines, so yeah, it is so happy. But it's sad to say that there was no replication for the other part of the data. Some user data, like user items, money, receipt, all of things were lost despite the replication. Yeah, users can sue me. <laughs> yeah, luckily, we had this raw JSON request logs, and we have backup data before one week. So we used the request JSON log to recover the lost. Finally, we could get the full data. Yeah. So the lesson learned. Backup is so important and replication is so necessary and check, check your backup well. And this situation can happen. This is one of the most absurd service failure case. In our case, overseas network from Korea to Japan had problems frequently. Packing loss rate increased over 50%. Our whole team panicked. <coughs> then just call AWS. AWS can help you everything. Uh, AWS, God. <laughs> uh, so it's now, now it's time to review. Our first design is here. And now it's changed to this architecture design. Yeah, so pretty cool, yeah. Awesome. Amazing, yeah. <laughs> And some future plans for us. 
First of all, we want to further improve our log system. And second, there are many countries that have poor network. And typical model game needs many communication between server and client. It can give bad experience to users of those poor network countries. So we are trying to adopt Quick protocol announced by Google. You can search libquick or go quick to see our progress. The most important thing is make a fun game and entertain the world. This is our ultimate goal. Yeah, thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Jamin. That was really cool. Uh, some interesting tips there. So, cool. OK, I wanted to uh, talk on one more thing that I thought would be useful to mobile and social gamers. Uh, and this is our Amazon Cognito service. Uh, Cognito is our mobile identity management and data synchronization service. Um, that's quite a mouthful, so let me break that down for you. Um, <clears throat> one of the key benefits behind Amazon Cognito is the identity broker component. Developers have the flexibility to use any of the, uh, uh, to choose which login providers they would like to support. Out of Amazon, Facebook, Google, uh, Twitter, any open ID provider, and they can also use their own authentication system to authenticate here. Once the user logs in, uh, they get a unique user identity uh, in, inside AWS. And from there, we focus on the actual identity of the user rather than the actual provider there. So if the user logs in with multiple identity providers from the same device, we combine those. And then we can kind of let them log in with anything, and it syncs across those things. Also, if they log in with the same identity provider on multiple devices, we will sync the data across there as well. Um, another cool thing there is that Cognito um, authenticates the user uh, with an IAM role. Um, so by default, this user has access to um, the Cognito data sync store, but you can expand that role. And once they have the credentials for that, they can interact with things like S3, DynamoDB, and Kinesis, and write events directly into Kinesis, upload files directly to S3, uh, maybe write records directly to DynamoDB or read directly from DynamoDB, as well as any other AWS service. Cool. So the other nice thing about uh, Cognito there is the ability to sync data. Um, so Cognito allows you to uh, enter key value um, data sets uh, for, against the identities. You can have up to 21 megabyte uh, key value data sets against an identity. And basically, the client SDKs allow you to write to a local uh, SQLite database that is then handled by the SDK and synced back up to uh, AWS and synced down to the other devices that you have there. So for instance, that means I can uh, pick up a new game, start playing at lunchtime on my Android phone, um, really love it, but have to get back to work. Then I pick up on my iPad on the train home, and I'm exactly where I left off. Then I get home, fire up my Fire TV, and then I can continue playing there again. That's a really cool. Right? Cool. Um, the other thing is you have a lot of control over the uh, synchronization methods used there. Um, also, when a synchronization happens, it emits events, which you can then post out to things like Lambda and Kinesis and do really funky stuff there. Um, I don't have enough time today to speak on all of that. Um, but again, here's some more sessions that you should check out. Um, again, the GAM 401 for the uh, serverless mobile game development. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that, so I'm just going to say MBL402 uh, for mobile <laughs> identity management and data synchronization with Cognito. Uh, and then there's a WRK202 uh, for building scalable mobile apps on serverless event triggered backend logic. Cool. So I've covered quite a lot of the uh, mobile and social gaming. Um, at this point, I want to invite player two, uh, Ian, <laughs> up to talk about mobile gaming. Thank you. So, Cheers, Mark. Well. I'm an evangelist with AWS based in the UK. I'm also a member of our uh, gaming SME community globally. I work with quite a few studios and publishers in the UK. And I'm also a uh, real fan of multiplayer games, played them for years of all different kinds. So I'm an expert on this topic. Okay. Uh, 
And what you can do here is start with a similar uh, architectural starting point to what we discussed earlier. So that HTTP or HTTP-based API that controls aspects of your single-player game can be extended to provide some of the core functionality that's required for multiplayer, so auth, course session management, and probably most importantly for this uh, particular use case is uh, player matchmaking. So how do you manage the allocation of gaming sessions from players onto the fleet of resources that you're going to use to support that? You, of course, then can continue to use CloudFront. Uh, and in multiplayer, of course, DLC and user-generated content is often a very important component. And importantly here, we're going to use CloudFront for both the upstream, so upload of those assets, doing that locally to reduce TCP session setup overhead, as well as for distributing content from the core engine out to the clients. Okay, So it's use of CloudFront bidirectionally. I don't know if that's a common deployment model for you, but it's something that is very commonly uh, utilized in this sort of architecture. And then, of course, we're going to add to that a, a public server tier. And here you're going to see the use of low latency, direct client socket connections using UDP or other socket protocols. Uh, and this is something that's relatively new in terms of a use case for, for EC2. We introduced a feature a few years ago called EC2 Enhanced Networking, which uses a platform feature called SRIOV. This offers significantly improved network throughput and also significantly reduced latency for TCP and UDP traffic to and from EC2 instances. And this was the, uh, the gate, really, that opened significant adoption of AWS for this particular use case. Okay, So with EC2 Enhanced Networking, uh, it's very possible and actually very common to use uh, AWS EC2, Amazon EC2, for this sort of use case. So what does the transaction flow look like when a client comes to connect? They're going to talk to your... API and they're going to log in via the API. They're going to make a matchmaking request there. And with logic at the back end behind the API there, you're going to get a game server IP if one is available, and you're going to return that back to the client. OK. Uh, if that game server IP is not available, maybe you don't have a resource available for this particular client to connect to at this point. Well, the API itself can programmatically drive scaling of the EC2 fleet that's going to act as your front end. So you could here, for example, scale on queue depth. How many players have I got waiting in my queue? And you could use that to create new instances within your front end fleet to enable you to deplete that queue and service those connection requests. That's quite a common uh, use case here, deployment model here. The other thing that we see here, of course, then you're going to connect to that server, pull down those assets. And uh, other players can join into your session, also being match made or match made maybe against your session. And this is how you do the state interchange and share information about the world state, uh, location of uh, physics objects in the world, and everything else that you need to create the multiplayer experience for your, for your players. Also have some users here, some customers here, that are going beyond uh, kind of triggered scaling of the fleet and using other techniques. Some customers using machine learning to determine how big their front end fleet needs to be at any particular point in time, and then pre-position those resources. We have talked about those kinds of approaches previously at reInvent. I think the difference now, of course, is we have our own machine learning service that you might use in that sort of use case to uh, allow you to programmatically calculate how big your front end fleet needs to be at any particular point in time, and also in any particular region. Okay. Multi-region. Uh, I'm sure everybody's experienced, uh, understands the importance of low latency in certain gaming models, uh, FPS, MOBA. You've got to have a low latency connection if you want to play on a level playing field globally. And with competitive play, this is really important. So it's very common to distribute those front end servers into different AWS regions around the world and to do that on the basis of trying to offer the lowest latency experience for players in different geographies. Okay, And obviously, Mark mentioned at the top of the session, 11 regions today that you can use for this. Uh, and EC2 is available in all regions, of course. So if that's the, the, the service that you're using to create this, uh, you can do that globally. You don't necessarily need to move your matchmaking API. It's unlikely to be anywhere near as latency sensitive as the game sessions themselves. It's very common for customers to keep their matchmaking uh, player or subscriber management and overall state control centralized in one location, make that a little bit easier to manage, and then combine this with distribution of those EC2 fleets in different regions. Okay, that's the approach that we, we normally see, see customers taking. 
And of course, you can continue to use that uh, scaling approach, talking to the EC2 API endpoint in different regions around the world to add and remove capacity in, in specific locations and make sure that customers can make that, players can make that local connection that they need to make sure that they've got good session performance. Okay, uh, we got, don't have a customer case study here talking about multiplayer in this session, but we do have some really cool uh, examples of customers that have built systems like this. If you go to GAM 403, you can see uh, Frontier Studios from the UK uh, talk about how they built Elite Dangerous, a uh, very successful, I think it was Kickstarter-funded uh, title. Uh, so a queued a lot of a lot of player hours, and also has a very interesting data model supporting this highly distributed uh, world state. So that's an interesting session to go to a deep dive in the 400 level. Uh, Evolve, uh, you know this uh, cross-platform uh, console title, one uh, v four multiplayer, where you've got a team of monster hunters that are hunting down an alien monster inside this sort of geodesic dome that, they've, that you play the game within. It's a perfect example of what I'm talking about, which is short duration matchmaking, where you're connecting five players uh, for a session, which is relatively short in duration, and you need to manage that. And of course, being a console title, very, very high in immediate adoption of the service and the product at day one launch. So they had some very interesting scaling challenges. I'm going to cover that in detail in GAM 404. And then uh, you'll be able to hear in GAM 407 about a brand new multi-screen mobile title uh, called Quiplash. I'm not very familiar with that, but if you want the details of that, drop into GAM 407 and you can hear more about that in that session. Okay, so we're going to wrap up. Uh, what have we covered? Auto-scaling, it's a mechanism for making sure that uh, players are happy and that you're being cost efficient. Using uh, the elastic characteristics of AWS, you can make sure you've got just the amount of resources that you need at any point in time, which means the right balance of, of cost and performance, right? Uh, CloudFront, extensive use uh, for download of uh, graphic assets and other fixed assets, patches, other content that might be required to distribute and maintain uh, gaming products. And of course, in the multiplayer context where you've got that user-generated content, you can also use that for upload, and that's going to accelerate performance and improve the experience of your players if you do that. Uh, for non-relational and particularly high write use cases where you've got lots of write contention, which would normally cause issues for relational data models with MySQL or other relational databases, uh, make use of DynamoDB. If you are interested in that, do drop into the other sessions in the database track where you're going to be able to find more about that, which Mark talked upon. And then lastly, uh, as I mentioned, uh, dynamic management of game servers using the EC2 API to control the creation and destruction of those front-end fleets in accordance to the amount of demand that you have or in, in line with the amount of demand that you've got at any point in time. That's a very useful tip, and I really would encourage you to explore that in more detail, even using advanced techniques like machine learning to, to pre-position capacity using those same APIs, okay? So that's it. Thanks very much for joining the session. Uh, you can find us on Twitter. You can also find us on Steam if you want to play with us. So uh, add us, okay? <laughs>